Foundation. Uh, it operates under the auspices of the Singapore ETH Center. And in its third phase, uh, currently, it has 13 research modules, uh, which focus on studying different aspects of sustainable cities and settlement systems. Uh, one such research module is dense and green cities, of which I'm a part. So before we start off with the what of what we're doing, uh, we can zoom out and try to understand why, why it's important to study dense and green cities. Uh, so the urban form of cities in the future is going to be vertical, with increasing densities, shrinking land areas for development, and the rising need to, en uh, to preserve enlarging and enlarge ecological systems. And Singapore is also now moving towards becoming a city in nature, which is a key pillar of the Singapore Green Plan 2030, uh, which is focusing on uh, advancing the Singapore, Singapore National Agenda on Sustainable Development, with uh, focusing on green, livable, and sustainable urban environments, reducing carbon emissions, increasing our energy efficiency, climate resilience, and food security. So high density cities such as Singapore need to turn towards vertical trends of development, given the conditions of land, land scarcity. So on the left, you see the interlace, which is a residential condominium that has uh, that's high density and is planned to maximize both airflow and light. On the right is an imagined vision of the future um, permeable lattice city concept by the architectural firm Buha. The dense and green cities research module, which is headed by Prof. Sasha Menz of ETH Zurich and Prof. Thomas Schroffer of SUTD, um, studies the development of sustainable integrated districts or SIDs. So SIDs are planned as test beds for innovative solutions and urban systems, uh, which can be scaled up for the, to the city and the larger region for future resilient planning. So SIDs are designed to test, uh, to present a model of sustainability with ec elevated economic performance and high livability. The research framework consists of different work packages, uh, starting with architecture, urban design, planning, social, environmental, economic, and governance systems of the case studies that we are planning to study. Uh, so we are a multidisciplinary team of architects, engineers, and scientists. Uh, we have a close collaboration with uh, stakeholders from government agencies as well as industry. And the case studies include uh, primarily Zurich and Singapore. The uh, Zurich uh, team is handling uh, currently Al Staten. And in the Singapore uh, case studies, we have One North, Jurong Lake District, and Pungol Digital District. We also have international case studies, uh, including Zuidas in Amsterdam and the King's Cross uh, Central in London. Um, so my background is in architecture and urban design, and my doctoral research falls within the purview of uh, the research that we do at Dense and Green Cities. Uh, my doctoral research questions uh, focus on the following. Uh, so what methods and tools allow urban designers to assess and compare the spatial configurations of dense and vertical urban districts? Uh, so this includes trying to understand and quantify a measure of spatial performance of such environments and using spatial network analysis concepts and tools to uh, determine a threshold of success if, of spatial performance, if any. So coming back to uh, the case studies in Singapore, we have One North, Jurong Lake District, and Pungol Digital District, like I mentioned. Uh, One North is an existing research and business uh, hub, a uh, business park. Uh, Jurong Lake District is a mixed use regional hub of the West and is planned to be the second largest business district in Singapore. It's uh, partially built, so our focus is on the existing development in the commercial uh, center of the district, which is Jurong Gateway. Uh, lastly, we have Pungo Digital District. Uh, which is an upcoming uh, development. It's a smart business park that's uh, being planned, uh, mixed use business district, and it's currently undergoing construction. Uh, One North is a hub for innovation and test bidding. It was developed by Zaha Adid Architects, uh, for which uh, the master plan, 
which sort of integrates a work, live, play, learn environment. Uh, so it primarily consists of office buildings, but it also includes residential, retail, uh, food and beverage amenities, um, as well as certain some schools and malls. Uh, Jurong Lake District, our second case study, uh, consists of Jurong Gateway, which is here, sorry, which is here, the commercial hub, uh, Jurong Lake Gardens, and a new uh, planned uh, mixed-use precinct, which is coming up here. Uh, on the right, you see a render of the, the mixed-use precinct that is envisioned by the architecture firm uh, KCAP. The district consists of office spaces, residences, and retail and food and beverage amenities. And Pungul Digital District is designed to integrate uh, industry and academia and serve as a vibrant economic hub in the north and house key growth sectors uh, and tech industries. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, present some of the work that my team is involved in, primarily in the architecture and urban design work package. And I work with network science concepts to understand pedestrian movement and flows in the case studies. Uh, the first case study that we worked on was One North Park. Uh, so in network science, the network is studied with, um, with mathematically derived uh, uh, centrality measures, which help us understand important nodes in the network. And it's also a very useful approach to studying patterns in cities. So based on the same line of thought, uh, spatial network analysis tools and methods have been developed since the 1970s to understand connectivity of spaces and uh, movement per distribution potential. So I'm sure some of you have heard of software like space syntax, SDNA, and urban network analysis, which study spatial networks to understand the accessibility through and to spaces. So here's a very brief introduction to some network centrality measures. Uh, between the centrality, which is what you see on the left, uh, is an indicator of a node's centrality in a network, uh, not necessarily the geographical center, but it's calculated by uh, the, the number of shortest paths from all vertices to all other vertices through a particular node. And so a node with a high between the centrality has a large influence on the transfer of movement or data through the network and under the assumption that the transfer happens uh, following the shortest paths. Closeness is a similar concept, which is the inverse of average distance from a given node to all other nodes in the network. And uh, the third concept that I'm going to introduce to you today is degree centrality, which is quite simply the number of links that a node has within a network. Uh, so coming back to our case studies and how it's applied there, in One North, um, uh, it's a research and business park, like I mentioned, and Zaha Adid Architects uh, won the competition to design the master plan for it in 2001. So the design strategy really focused on transport accessibility, pedestrian connectivity across the district, and a lot of business connections. So using a, like a bent urban grid, uh, like you can see in the sketch on the right, and uh, from some of the images uh, that the architecture firm has on the right, uh, you can see that the linear park through the district is sort of envis uh, envisioned as a linear spine of the district. And it it's, it's meant to follow the existing terrain, so an undulating landscape, uh, providing interesting vistas and some steep slopes. So although it was planned as a continuous green space, uh, you can see the, on the image on the left that the One North Park is actually divided by the road network. Uh, into multiple parcels. So we study six parcels, P3, P4, P5, P6, P7, and P11, which are existing, have been constructed. Um, and we first enough wanting to understand um, whether these parcels actually act as spatial connectors like they were like they intend to, and whether they um, you know provide or facilitate easy connections between various precincts of the district. Um, so the network analysis was conducted using SDNA, which is a GIS-supported plugin that helps to measure uh, compute measures of accessibility within uh, the network. And so the analysis was also weighted with um, a scoring framework that helps us understand the attractiveness of many functional spaces, such as restaurants, um, park spaces, play areas, and other eateries or um, which act as um, 
you know, destination spaces for many pedestrians, as well as factors such as topography, which is a uh, deterrent uh, for pedestrians and qualitative factors like shade and pedestrian path width. So we also con conducted an experiment with people counter devices, uh, which we placed in uh, strategic locations in each park parcel, like you can see on the right, uh, as well as entry points to each of the park parcels. So these devices act as gates. So people pass them and get counted as in each direction. And uh, we had a total of 31 locations documented over a span of eight weeks. Um, our results are shown in this video here, which is a heat map that shows the hourly variation of recorded flows in each parcel of the park. So you will start seeing the first uh, flows around 6 a.m. So this is a typical weekday, and uh, we see that there's a consistent uh, flows in P3 and P4. We see three uh, peaks of flows, which is 8 to 9 a.m. in the morning, 12 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and 6 to 7 p.m. These coincide with um, pre-office hours and post-office hours commutes. Um, and this makes sense. This is an obvious conclusion since One North is predominantly an office um, space, office park. It can be understood that um, the, the mixed use context of certain of these parcels, P3 and P4, which are very adjacent to hotel and residential developments, and P6, which act actually acts as a spillover space for a building, uh, an office building. So you sort of have to enter the park to enter the building. Um, act as very important spatial connectors consistently uh, throughout the weekday. And certain other spaces like P11 and P5 and P7 are more of destination spaces. So when they do have some flows, uh, it's, it's more of because people have actually gone there for the park. And uh, P5 in particular, the largest parcel in One North, uh, acts as a spatial barrier, but that can mostly be because it's it's quite undulating and the, top, the topography, is, the terrain is quite uh, steep. And so we understand it as a spatial barrier. <clears throat> um, in the bi-directional flows also helped us understand spatial occupancy in the parcels. So especially in the weekend when the usual office uh, commuter floors are minimal. So within an hour, if the entry flows are much higher, uh, significantly higher than the exit flows, it can indicate that there's some amount of occupancy or just resident, like just residing within the parcel during the, the duration of that hour. And um, we, this is across, so the, the image is across Monday to Sunday in certain time periods. And we noticed that unlike our previous assumption that One North Park is quite dead in the weekend, it actually does have occupancy and flows in the weekend. So the difference um, between the entry and exit flows uh, are quite obvious in the, in, in the morning, 8 to 9 a.m. and in the evening as well, the trends, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. where people are clearly um, passing by to, you know, as office commuters. Uh, in the weekend, it's quite interesting because some of the parcels actually see high, significantly high entry flows, including P11. So that indicates a continued occupancy, uh, which makes it as an urban um, destination or an urban attractor by, uh, in and of itself. And that was quite um, interesting to us as a, a study because it, it challenged some of our assumptions of the park and helped us understand how this park is being used on a very temporal basis. Uh, the next study I want to talk about is our ongoing study in Jurong Lake Gardens. Uh, Jurong Lake Gardens is Singapore's third national garden and the first in the heartlands. So currently, um, the, uh, the, the red highlighted outline is the part of Jurong Lake Gardens within the Jurong Lake District. And the image on the right shows you uh, the path that's currently, the outline path that's currently open to visitors, uh, which is Lakeside Gardens. And the rest of the garden is actually still under renovation. <clears throat> um, and the garden, uh, so this is the Lakeside Garden, which is designed by Rambold Studio Dry Settle, Singapore. And the garden includes play areas, seating spaces, meandering paths by the water, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, food and beverage spots, 
and many decks for recreational activities like cycling and bird watching. Uh, the lit path that you see in the image here is Rasal Walk, which is a boardwalk along a restored freshwater swamp. And um, it contains over 50 species of plants. So it has a very high ecological significance as well to its um, social attractions. Um, the research question we wanted to study was to really understand the activity hotspots and explore the, the parts within the, the, the built existing part of the garden that has a high uh, pedestrian flows. So what they can tell us about the con connectivity of the parts and, any, and really explore any insights uh, about the usage of the spaces. So with the help of some architecture students from SEPT University, India, we mapped pedestrian flows and activity in the garden quite manually. Uh, so on the left is the image with the positions of the students as they counted passerby, passersby for a duration of two hours. And the heat map shows the parts with the, the most activity. Uh, we fed the mapped counts to our between the centrality analysis by using a regularized uh, multivariate ridge regression. So the ridge regression uh, helps us choose the, <clears throat> the best variable to explain the correlation between the betweenness uh, centrality measures of the parts and uh, the mapped flows. And we apply it to the network again to help us predict uh, the spaces with the possibly predict uh, the spaces with the high pedestrian footfall. Um, what we have is um, on model on the right, which is which is more intuitive to what we know, and it is tested um, and can be validated, but with a second uh, set of uh, map data. Uh, we also found that <clears throat> early results indicate a direct correlation between activity and closeness or density. So preliminary results show that certain spaces which have um, groups of um, Parts that are close together uh, and see higher counts of activity. So these are usually play areas. They're designed to have smaller meandering parts uh, around the play equipment. They're not necessarily critical connectors in the larger garden, but display a small scale of high density connections um, that happen to encourage people to, to stop for a bit, stay in the space. Um, and as you can see, the mapping data on the right um, helped us uh, really go beyond what the people counter sensors could possibly tell us because we get some more demographic data, we get some more activity data. And we plan to extend the study um, to, I mean, the natural extension of the study would be if we could take the master plan of the larger Jurong Lake Gardens, including the, the parts that's under construction, uh, which is the Chinese garden here, um, and really help this uh, map these flows, map the, the observed flows and and understand um, or predict, you know, a pedestrian distribution um, in the garden. So lastly, I want to talk about our ongoing study at Jurong Gateway. Uh, Jurong Gateway is the commercial hub of Jurong Lake District and the West region. So Jurong Gateway is intended to cater to uh, diverse needs of businesses and create job opportunities closer to where people live. And it's centered around the Jurong East MRT station with an area of 70 hectares. And the Jurong Gateway uh, offers a lot of office spaces, uh, retail spaces, and uh, hospital and other uses. So what's really unique about Jurong Gateway in the context of Singapore is that the elevated pedest uh, Jaywalk pedestrian uh, network, it uh, offers, like in the image you see on the left, so these are a series of connections between various buildings that start from the Jurong East MRT station. And the Jaywalk uh, network allows commuters a seamless pedestrian connectivity from the Jurong East MRT. And the two levels of street really form an integrated multi-level street network that improves the overall accessibility of buildings in the vicinity. And the Jaywalk network is also slated to extend to the Lakeside Gateway, which is a new mixed use precinct being planned in Jurong Lake District. Um, so our research question here, so like you can see in the images on the right, um, the street connections on the, on the street level, as well as the, the Jaywalk uh, elevated level uh, between the hospital towers in the last image on the right, uh, really has an integrated, you know, 
three-dimensional or straight lattice, if you can imagine it like that. And so our research question is to really understand how these two connections at the level two increase the pedestrian flows in the elevated network over the street level network and to understand how jaywalk performs as a spatial connector. Our preliminary results show that the parts on the elevated jaywalk network have significantly more pedestrian flows than their counterparts in the street level, owing to the seamless connectivity at the elevated level and restricted crossings in the road level. Um, the jaywalk linkages specifically increase the closeness centrality of the hospital towers uh, the David Nair Institute here and the IMM Mall. <clears throat> so this in in indicates an increased uh, accessibility to these buildings, um, and it's also it also can be argued that the Jaywalk uh, uh, network um, increases the spatial cohesion of the district, improving walkability, economic performance of the malls, and urban vibrancy. So this can be applied in multiple simulation scenarios like of Jaywalk that's connecting um, the hospital right here to the upcoming business development that's that's here and which would be then connecting back to the Gem Mall and the Jurong East MRT. Um, it's also to understand uh, the another application is to understand and predict flows in the second phase of the Jaywalk network, which is planned to extend in the south of the MRT to other buildings. Um, I think I have may have run a little faster than I intended to. And so I'm wrapping up with uh, my, my presentation with implications to urban planning and design. Uh, some insights of these research is that the methodology or a version of this method can be applied in the design and future planning of pedestrian environments as well as the improvement of current ones. So uh, we have, uh, we're studying integrated districts as well um, as SIDs like I talked about. And we, we want to contribute, uh, I mean, this methodology will hopefully contribute knowledge about how the integrated districts can function. Um, it also helps strengthen predictive analysis of activity and pedestrian flows. So it helps us predict behaviors in existing and new layouts uh, and helps us de uh, de determine the future need for an improvement in the pedestrian layout. So it can measure the effect of the addition of new functions or infrastructure as well, or activity spaces. And it also provides a basis for comparative analysis uh, between comparative studies between uh, the urban, uh, urban districts and master plans of planned urban districts. And it helps uh, formulate strategies in the integration of existing and planned urban districts which are integral to architecture planning and design. Um, thank you. I think that's my time. Uh, I guess we can open to questions and have a more interactive session. Uh, hi, everyone. So Feel free to turn on your microphone or type your questions in the chat box below at the right side.
Okay, um, so thank you everyone who attended and um, I think I'm 10 minutes earlier than I hope to finish. But um, I hope this was an interesting um, presentation and I hope um, feel free to reach out to me in case you have any questions on LinkedIn. Thank you.